Welcome to Art in Fiction. I'm Jeremy Hunt, and today I'm going to be reading Oliver Goldsmith, The Vicar of Wakefield. I'm reading two sections from The Vicar of Wakefield, written in 1761 and 1762, and published in 1766, which became one of the most widely read books in English literature. The novel follows the fortunes and misfortunes of a Yorkshire vicar, Dr Primrose and his family. Part 1, Chapter 16. The family use art, which is opposed with still greater. The first section I've chosen for art and fiction is a narrative that provides an unparalleled description of an itinerant painter plying the artist trade in the English provinces in the mid-18th century. In chapter 16, Dr Primrose commissions a family group portrait. The excitement and discussion of the costume and composition is enjoyed by the whole village. The social cachet and class distinctions, or minor snobbery, of having a portrait painted are keenly understood. The fun of dressing and posing in an appropriate attitude and the importance of costumes and the arrangement in the painting indicates a light knowledge of classical and suitable art historical figures as models. Dr Primrose adopts a theological intellectual pose, while his wife Deborah and their six children choose to be depicted as Venus, Cupids, a shepherdess and an Amazon. And they were flattered that the local squire, the villainous Thornhill, wished to be included without too much modesty and appropriate to his social status as Alexander the Great. The painter, or travelling Limna, who took likenesses for 15 shillings a head, is not considered important enough to be named. My wife and daughters, happening to return a visit at neighbour Flamborough's, found that the family had lately got their pictures drawn by a limner, who travelled the country and took likenesses for 15 shillings a head. As this family and ours had a long sort of rivalry in point of taste, our spirit took the alarm at this stolen march upon us, and, notwithstanding all I could say, and I said much, it was resolved that we should have our pictures done too. Having therefore engaged the limner, for what could I do? Our next deliberation was to show the superiority of our taste in the attitudes. And as for our neighbour's family, there were seven of them, and they were drawn with seven oranges, a thing quite out of taste, no variety in life, no composition in the world. We desired to have something in a brighter style, and after many debates at length came to the unanimous resolution of being drawn together in one large historical family piece. This would be cheaper since one frame would serve for all, and it would be infinitely more genteel, for all families of any taste were now drawn in the same manner. As we did not immediately recollect an historical subject to hit us, we were contented each with being drawn as independent historical figures. My wife desired to be represented as Venus, and the painter was requested not to be too frugal of his diamonds in her stomachs and hair. Her two little ones were to be as cupids by her side, while I, in my gown and band, was to present her with my books on the Wistonian controversy. Olivia would be drawn as an Amazon, sitting upon a bank of flowers, dressed in a green joseph, richly laced with gold, and a whip in her hand. Sophia was to be a shepherdess, with as many sheep as the painter could put in for nothing. And Moses was to be dressed out with a hat and a white feather. Our taste so much pleased the squire that he insisted on being put in as one of the family in the character of Alexander the Great at Olivia's feet. This was to be considered by us all an indication of his desire to be introduced into the family, nor could we refuse his request. The painter was therefore set to work, and as he wrought with assiduity and expedition, in less than four days the whole was completed. The piece was large, and it must be owned he did not spare his colours, for which my wife gave him great enconiums. We were all perfectly satisfied with his performance. But an unfortunate circumstance, which had not occurred till the picture was finished, now struck us with dismay. It was so very large that we had no place in the house to fix it. How we all came to disregard so material a point is inconceivable, but certain it is we had all been greatly remiss. This picture, therefore, instead of gratifying our vanity, as we hoped, leaned in the most mortifying manner against the kitchen wall, where the canvas was stretched and painted, much too large to be got through any of the doors and the jest of all our neighbours. One compared it to Robinson Crusoe's longboat, too large to be removed. Another thought it more resembled a reel in a bottle. Some wondered how it could be got out, but still more were amazed how it ever got in.
but though it excited the ridicule of some, it effectually raised more malicious suggestions in many. The squire's portrait being found united with ours was an honour too great to escape envy. Scandalous whispers began to circulate at our expense, and our tranquillity was continually disturbed by persons who came as friends to tell us what was said of us by our enemies. These reports were always resented with becoming spirit, but scandal ever improves by opposition. In the second section, I'm going to read the theme of artistic activity that occurs in the Vicar of Wakefield. It indicates how the wealthy and the middle classes were interested in art and cultural aspirations. They provided a status symbol to reflect their prosperity and social position. In England, the arts were emerging from religious and political suppression, and by the beginning of the 18th century, the new wealth of the British Empire supported the interest in the visual arts as an economic commodity. The auction house Sotheby's was founded in 1744. The rival auction house Christie's was founded in 1766, the same year as the novel was published, while the Royal Academy, active from 1761, was founded in 1768. In chapter 20, the young vicar of Wakefield, Dr Primrose, is instructed in the niceties and tricks of the art trade in Paris. The narrative suggests that there was little confidence in the connoisseurship of the art dealer or in the role of guide on the grand tour of France and Italy. The rule of art knowledge was to appear to know a little more than your client. From 1660 onwards, the grand tour was undertaken by nobility and the wealthy, the upper class and the nouveau riche, in a rite of passage that continued until the arrival of rail travel in Europe in the 1840s. This was intended as a voyage to admire the classical culture of Italy that might add knowledge and sophistication to young men's minds and aesthetic taste. The novel indicates that the tourists had little interest in observing the culture and the main interest in art was as objects to resell for a profit. In this manner I proceeded to Paris with no design but just to look about me and then to go forward. The people of Paris are much fonder of strangers that have money than those that have wit. As I could not boast much of either, I was no great favourite. After walking about the town four or five days and seeing the outsides of the best houses, I was preparing to leave this retreat of venal hospitality, when passing through one of the principal streets, who should I meet but our cousin, to whom you first recommended me? This meeting was very agreeable to me, and I believe not displeasing to him. He inquired into the nature of my journey to Paris, and informed me of his own business there, which was to collect pictures, medals, intaglios, and antiques of all kinds for a gentleman in London, who had just stepped into taste and a large fortune. I was the more surprised at seeing our cousin pitched upon for this office, as he himself had often assured me he knew nothing of the matter. Upon asking how he had been taught the art of a cognoscento so very suddenly, he assured me that nothing was more easy. The whole secret consisted in a strict adherence to two rules. The one, always to observe that the picture might have been better if the painter had taken more pains, and the other, to praise the works of Pietro Perugino. But, says he, as I once taught you how to be an author in London, I'll now undertake to instruct you in the art of picture buying in Paris. With this proposal, I very readily closed as it was a living, and now all my ambition was to live. I went, therefore, to his lodgings, improving my dress by his assistance, and after some time accompanied him to auctions of pictures, where the English gentry were expected to be purchasers. I was not a little surprised at his intimacy with people of the best fashion, who referred themselves to his judgment upon every picture or medal as an unerring standard of taste. He made very good use of my assistance upon these occasions, for when asked his opinion he would gravely take me aside and ask mine, shrug, look wise, return, and assure the company that he could give no opinion upon an affair of such importance. Yet there was sometimes an occasion for a more supported assurance. I remember to have seen him, after giving his opinion that the colouring of the picture was not mellow enough, very deliberately take a brush with brown varnish that was accidentally by, and rub it over the piece with great composure before all the company, and then ask if he had not improved the tints. When he had finished his commission in Paris, he left me, strongly recommended to several men of distinction as a person very proper for a travelling tutor, and after some time I was employed in that capacity by a gentleman who brought his ward to Paris in order to set him forward on his tour through Europe. I was to be the young gentleman's governor, 
but with the proviso that he should always govern himself. My pupil, in fact, understood the art of guiding and money concerns much better than I. He was heir to a fortune of about £200,000, left him by an uncle in the West Indies, and his guardians, to qualify him for the management of it, had bound him apprentice to an attorney. Thus avarice was his prevailing passion. All his questions on the road were, how much money might be saved? Which was the least expensive course of travelling? Whether anything could be bought that would turn to account when disposed of again in London? Such curiosities on the way as could be seen for nothing, he was ready enough to look at. But if the sight of them was to be paid for, he usually asserted that he had been told that they were not worth seeing. He never paid a bill that he would not observe. How amazingly expensive travelling was, and all this, though he was not yet twenty-one.